Father, this morning we are here. All of us here are here only because of one reason. And that's your son, Jesus. If it weren't for him, we would have been a people without hope. As your word says, separated from God, doomed. But because of Christ, we've been brought together. Different nations, different races, different tongues, made one in Christ. And we just thank you, Lord, for the liberty we have here to worship you. To lift that name up, which millions of our brothers do not have. They cannot put up a star. They cannot sing loud. They cannot use a musical instrument. Yet they too adore you. In the spirit, in the inner man, we join our hearts with all of them. And we just worship you today. As we look into your word, I pray, Lord, we have heard hundreds of Christmas messages over the years. But Lord, in your treasury, you have said to your servants to bring out the old and the new. And I pray today, we, your people, called by your name, will partake of something from your treasury, both old and new. And we'll go home filled. We'll go home blessed. We'll go home refreshed. We'll go home challenged. Speak to us, O Lord. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. For those who are here with us for the very first time, please remember our word is fairly long. It is not 30 minutes and goodbye. It's many 30 minutes. <laughs> Yesterday early morning I was at the airport to pick my niece. Then I saw from the airport to everywhere, you see the sights, the sounds, and the lights of Christmas. The Christmas tree was up there, even in the airport with the decoration. The music was there. If you go to the shops, to the malls, even the banners, morning we were coming, we found a banner, a poor man had got his... Uh, the spelling wrong, where he wrote Merry Christmas. <laughs> yes, we laughed. Then when I was sitting over there, the Lord was speaking to me. He said, I actually came on Christmas Day to marry for a bride. That's why I came. But curiously, if you look through all these shops and malls, all these decorated places, you see something, or rather, somebody missing. Christ is missing on his birthday. And curiously, if you notice, his place in the world has been taken by a, a chubby, fat man in a red dress. The world loves him. Sadly, the church also Loves him quite a bit. Children love him. The sounds of Christmas. Jingle bells, Santa Claus, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Frosty the, stone, uh, the Snowman. Well, let me tell you, this morning and last night as I was checking my Bible, I found all those words missing. In the original Christmas story, I didn't find them anywhere. 
and the sights of Christmas. The Christmas tree, the bells, the holly, the wreath, snow. It's there. Not even the star was there. Because we think the star was there. But the Magi came almost two years after he was born. So when he was born, even the star wasn't there. So the sounds, the sights of Christmas, I didn't find them in the Bible. What about the words? Yes, you have words like joy and peace on earth and glad tidings. We know those words, right? We heard some of the words in the songs too. But one thing I have learned over the years while studying the Bible is read carefully and look at the words God emphasizes. Words God uses over and over connected with a situation or a context. Surprise, surprise. You will find strangely in the Christmas narrative written by God, especially in the Gospel according to Luke and Gospel according to Matthew, are two words which we hardly ever use or hear connected with Christmas. Ten times at least connected with Christmas, with the announcement, the pronouncements, the word behold is used. When God says behold, then we better look carefully. That's what he means behold, look. Look, listen, understand. Then you also have to ask, what do I behold? Do I see what you are trying to show me? Another word we may not associate at all with Christmas narrative, again, almost a dozen times, is the word fear. Either it is fear not, or people were afraid. Another word you hear is the word troubled. Now, these are not Christmas words, right? Because we have decided what Christmas words are. But God also has already decided what Christmas words are. In Luke one twenty nine, scripture says, when the first announcement was made, Mary was troubled. Was troubled. In Matthew 2, 3, a couple of years later, when the announcement was made, Herod the king had heard this thing. He was troubled. And all of Jerusalem was troubled. So what was God trying to tell us? Behold, look closely. What do you see? What do you sense? What do you feel? Why were some people excited? Some people terrified. Does Jesus have that effect on the world? Yes, he does. That's why very quietly and subtly we have removed Jesus from the public space and put Santa over there because he troubles no one. He convicts no one. He confronts no one. Every man of every religion is happy with him. Now when we get to the actual narrative, God's Christmas narrative doesn't actually begin in Bethlehem. It begins in Jerusalem. It always has to begin in Jerusalem. For God's order never changes. That's his capital. That's his eternal city. And that's where his temple is and will be. An old man on that day, before Jesus was born, much before Jesus was born, on that day, an old man, that day he was a priest. And every priest who was called to serve in the temple waited for that one day probably in their life when the Lord fell on him. They waited for that day because that day they were allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies and offer the incense. 
that day it fell on an old man called Zechariah. He turned into the entered into the holy place to actually to burn the incense. But when he entered into the holy holy place, or the holy place on the right side of the altar, Rama the holy the incense was right there, right there, and just the curtain separated the incense altar from the holy of holies. That was what is there. The, the, the candle and the table were on the other side, but the incense was right there. And when he looked, on the right hand side stood an angel. And he was terrified. Strange, right? If you go to church, saying that I'm going to church, I'm hoping to encounter God, and you encounter God, you're afraid. What did you go to church for? Who else do you expect to see in the holy place? But Zachariah was terrified. He was afraid. He was afraid. But the king is coming. And before the king comes, the king's arrival has to be announced. And the angel says, Zachariah, you and your wife have been chosen for this purpose. You and your wife. Zachariah and Elizabeth, you have been chosen for this purpose. Now if you turn with me to one of the last books in the Old Covenant, Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 1, In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet. Only, only verse 1. It's one of the last books with this the canon closes. Zechariah, Malachi, and after that, canon closes. After that, for 400 years, God did not speak to his people. 400 years, man has been waiting to hear from God. Religion is there, the temple is there, the rituals are there, everything is going, but nobody has heard from God. 400 years later, God is going to break his silence. And he breaks his silence to another man called Zechariah. Now you would be wondering, what does this have to be there? Everything has meaning in the Bible, because very rarely it does. In the Bible, if you look, three generations are mentioned while introducing a man. Usually, you will see Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. But when God says, Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, then you have to stop and say, Lord, why did you mention his grandfather also? Right? Let me tell you. Zechariah means whom Jehovah remembers. Berechiah means Jehovah blesses. Ido means at the appointed time. So the meaning, if you put it together, means whom Jehovah remembers and blesses at the appointed time. 400 years later, when the angel comes and makes the pronouncement, he says, Zachariah, you and your wife have been chosen. And your wife's name is Elizabeth. And the meaning of Elizabeth is he remembers his oath. And God says, Jehovah remembers his oath made 400 years ago. The king is coming. That's how the pronouncement begins. In Luke 1, verse 6 and 7, we are given introduction to this man. And they were both righteous, Elizabeth and Zacharias, before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now this is God saying, two old people, an old couple, righteous, blameless. But there is a problem. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years. When God says, well stricken in years, that means they were really old. So the first Christmas, mes the, the message in the first pronouncement during that season is this. Has anyone given up on the purpose of God in your life because you think it's been too long 
and I've seen, I've seen nothing in my life. I'm old. Spiritually, I am barren. I'm not bringing forth anything. Have you given up? God says, don't give up. Don't stop praying. For your purpose is connected with Christ. If your purpose is connected with Christ, it can come only in the fullness of God's time. It cannot come in my time when I am young and fertile. It has to come in the fullness of God's time. When God's time comes, you and I may be old and barren. But doesn't matter, that is God's time. Some of your prayers may be connected with actually Christ. Then wait for God's time. For until it is time for Christ to be manifested, that prayer cannot be answered. But never stop praying. Delay is not denial. The first pronouncement is, Zechariah, your prayer only has been delayed. It has not been denied. That's the incredible part of the first pronouncement in verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. So did you know Zechariah was praying for a child? Even though he was old and stricken in years and his wife's womb was barren, he never stopped praying. Because he knew there was something in his and his wife's life connected with God. So he stopped, never stopped praying. And on that appointed day by God, the Lord fell on him. He enters into the holy place to go to put incense, which is symbolic of prayer rising to God. Before he can even put incense, God says, your prayer has been heard, your prayer has been answered. It's been heard, it's been answered. Why? Because you never stop praying. Because on that day, the prayer of his heart and the act of his hands became one. And God said, you've been hurt. And I'm telling somebody here, there'll be a day and the cry of your heart, the act of your life will become one and God will say, you have been answered. Don't give up. Don't give up. Maybe you've been looking for that change, Christ to come into somebody in your life. Maybe a child, a spouse, a parent, and you must be thinking it's well advanced in years and I don't see any change. Looks barren. God says don't give up. Delay is not denial. For the answer is connected with the purpose of God. May you too hear, do not be afraid. Your prayer has been answered. The second couple we see in the Christmas narrative is of course Joseph and Mary. When the angel said, Behold, you will conceive, Mary did not struggle with the truth. She struggled with understanding the process because she knew a little of biology. The problem is, in the first problem was the womb was barren. The second problem was the womb was virgin. To the first one, God says, your wife will bear a child. I am so old and she is old. God says, don't worry, nothing is impossible with God. The next case, the womb is virgin. She says, child I understand, husband I have none. Are you getting the picture? But her answer is forever echoed in the annals of the history of faith. In Luke one thirty-eight. This is what she says. And Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. There are twelve beholds in the Christmas narrative. It's only in one behold a person tells God, Behold, I am your servant. The rest, almost every time God says, Behold, he is your saviour. One woman stands up and says, Behold, I am your handmaiden. Let it be 
unto me according to your word. Let us look at this teenage Jewish girl in a little hamlet called Bethlehem who just believed and surrendered. She will rush to see her cousin Elizabeth. You have to study Mary's song. It's not a song from Mary. It's a song from the Holy Spirit. And you have to read Hannah's song. And it is not Hannah's song. It is a song of the Holy Spirit. And both are not a song which a mother will sing. Both are battle cries of the Redeemer that is coming. Read it carefully. They're practically the same. Hannah's song and Mary's song. When she runs to her older cousin, something miraculous happens over there. And the Holy Spirit makes a pronouncement about Mary through her cousin Elizabeth. You see that in verse 45. Because everyone will say she is the blessed of all women. But why? Because blessed is she who believed. That's why she is blessed. So is everyone here who have believed. You are blessed. If you have believed, you are blessed. Blessed is he or she who has believed in you and her Christ was birthed. Mary was remembered, troubled by the angel's pronouncement. Poor Joseph was troubled by Mary's pregnancy. An angel came to him too and said, Don't be afraid. Take her as your wife. Why? Behold, the virgin shall give birth. Behold, the angel in a dream took Joseph back to the prophecy in the book of Isaiah and says, Behold, behold, the virgin shall give birth. Mary was given a visitation by an angel. Poor Joseph was given a dream and a scripture. Both believed. Blessed is he or she who believes. Those who believe the spoken word of God or those who believe the written word of God. For if you believe, you will see. And you don't have to fear. The virgin will conceive. What does it mean? What does that mean to us? The pronouncement, the virgin will conceive. God will work in new ways in which I don't understand. 2014 is coming. Don't expect God to work in the ways you always experienced. He does things in ways we don't understand. Believe. Two, second message to the second couple and to all of us, men sitting in this congregation, don't be afraid of the ministry God is doing through your wife. Don't put her away because of that or put her down because of that. Joseph wanted to put away Mary because God was birthing a ministry in her. And to men who get frightened by the ministry of their wives, God says, relax. Relax. Don't put her away. What she is doing is of God. So the first who are blessed are those who pray without giving up. Second are those who believe without seeing. For they will then see. The third set of people to whom the pronouncement of the born baby is made is very strange. That's why God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. If you cannot hear at the back, you need to show your hands, okay? And the sound people will increase the volume. It's no point sitting there and just seeing my motions. You need to hear 
Recently we had a prince born. Did you see the cameras? Did you see the crowds? Did you see the announcement? And here is the irony of it all. You don't, I don't understand God's ways at all. Here in Bethlehem is born the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God was visiting planet Earth in flesh once and once alone. One son of God and no other births. The actual biggest event in human history. The mayor of Bethlehem, Bethlehem had no clue. The high priest of Jerusalem was kept in the dark. Caesar and his kings had no idea at all. The palace doesn't hear. The temple doesn't ring any bells. Jerusalem doesn't know. The only ones, the only ones to whom the announcement is made is a poor set of shepherds. In Luke 2 and verse 10, Then the angel sent, said to them, Don't be afraid, fear not. And behold, two words to them too. Fear not, don't be afraid. Behold, to Zacharias, God said, Don't be afraid, behold. To Joseph, he said, Don't be afraid, behold. To the shepherds, he said, Don't be afraid, behold. Behold, I'm bringing you good news. Really good news. Question is, why didn't God go in our order? None of us would do things this way. If a king was to come, the king of kings was to come. This is the last set of people we want to give the announcement. We would put it on block letters in Jerusalem times. It didn't happen. But there is a reason. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 15, we will see how the kingdom of God is directly opposed to this kingdom of this world. He said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. The second part, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination, is an abomination to God. What is highly esteemed among men? Think, what is that we esteem? All that we esteem, all that we esteem is an abomination to God. That's why there are no cameras, no heralds, nothing is pronounced to the kings or the queens or the big who is who. If we have a party, we want to boast who came. If we have friends, we will go in the pecking order. You know, this is my friend, that is my friend, this is my friend, that is my friend. Doesn't happen with God that way. He doesn't make the pronouncement to Caesar. He doesn't make the pronouncement to Herod. He doesn't make the pronouncement to any royalty, any powerful person in the world. You know the first two times the word abomination is used in the Bible? It's interesting if you study. The first time the word abomination is used is when Joseph's brothers visit Joseph. And Joseph doesn't reveal who he is to his brothers. And when it is time to eat, they all eat separately. Joseph eats separately because he's governor. His brothers eat separately and the Egyptians eat separately because the Hebrews are an abomination to the Egyptians. God's people are an abomination to this world. Don't try to be popular in this world. Remember the spiritual truth. If you are a true child of God, in the eyes of the world, you are an abomination. So to them first, God will give his news. Second, when Joseph tells his brothers, when the Pharaoh asks you, what do you do and all that, he says, tell the Pharaoh, we are shepherds. And there is a reason. In Genesis 46, verse 34, this is what Joseph says. 
you shall say your servant's occupation has been livestock from our youth even till now but both we and also our fathers that you may dwell in the land of goshen for every shepherd is an abomination is an abomination in egypt every shepherd is an abomination so if what is highly esteemed in the world is an abomination to god what is an abomination in the world is esteemed before god god said let us make the first pronouncement to those poor hebrew shepherds not to anybody else to the hebrew shepherds and you see their response in chapter 2 of luke and verse 15 215 onwards look 215 onwards so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven the shepherds said to one another let us now go what did they say let us go let us now go did they say let me go take a shower let me go check my wardrobe what my best costume to wear for christmas day that's why i say on christmas day though we don't have christmas trees many look like christmas trees <laughs> did they say any of those things they said let us go let us go verse 15 let us go verse 16 quickly verse 16 what do they say so they made haste they didn't come the way we usually come to church it's okay worship must be going on I'm telling you in this city I have preached in churches where people came in even during the time of benediction received the benediction and went for tea <laughs> they too claim Christ is their savior I don't know what they have been saved from that I don't know they said let us make haste they came with haste and verse 20 sorry verse 17 when they had seen him they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child what did they do they were the first set of people to proclaim outside jesus is born god never changes his order even today the proclamation of jesus is given to shepherds He didn't give the proclamation to the grand high priest in the, in in Jerusalem. He said, "Let my shepherds go and proclaim." And they made haste and they made known abroad that Jesus is come. Did we make haste? Have we made haste to proclaim about Jesus to the people around whom we live, the people to whom God has sent? You know why? Because we are not poor in the spirit that's the reason god knows who will speak about him he's always used the poor the outcasts the samaritan woman as soon as she encountered jesus and knew he was the messiah she left her water pot and ran to the town and said come see the messiah she didn't need any evangelism class the poor don't need the poor when they meet their savior will proclaim their savior they don't need any prop they need don't need any push they go they proclaim the shepherds went and proclaimed and verse 20 also will say how did they come back the shepherds returned glorifying and praising god did you see how we struggle to worship god today various forms of worship was there this 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 
If you are a pastor and during worship time stand at the back of the church, you can see all forms of worship. But scripture says, the shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard. I think they were jumping, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> what did they see? Just a little baby boy. And the angels told them, that is the Redeemer. That's all they needed. They ran. They saw. They spread the word. They praised. They glorified. You know what's the third message of Christmas? God is not a respecter of persons. You don't need an MD in theology to speak about Christ. You just need a heart. He knows who will make haste. He knows who will proclaim. He knows who will return praising and glorifying God. Please remember, they got nothing. They only saw. They only heard. They didn't receive a miracle. They were in healed. Their flocks did not increase. Their stomachs were not full. But they praised. And they glorified. And they went to them. The pronouncement was made. Praising God for all. What is the pronouncement? The angels made to them. Behold. Behold. You will see that in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Do you know our God knows how to talk to us individually and touch us where it concerns us? To each person in the Bible to whom God has spoken about his son, he has spoken differently. To the shepherds alone he is told, unto you is born this day where? Where? In Bethlehem? What did he say? In the city of? Remember, your old shepherd. Do you remember your old shepherd? In his city, the Savior has come. Every shepherd in Israel connected with David because David was a shepherd. And he said, in the city of David, the shepherd has come. Now, the third set of people we include in our traditional Christmas narrative are the wise men. But they are not. They are not. They came, like I said, at least two years later. They didn't see a baby. They saw a young child. They didn't come to a manger. They came to a house. You have to read scripture carefully. And once they found and were warned and left without telling Herod, Herod found out the exact time of the child's birth and killed all the children under the age of two. So in our Christmas narrative, though in our Christmas dramas we put them all together, the third set of people to whom the pronouncement was made was not the wise men. If it was not the wise men, then to whom was it made? To two people. Please remember this. God always makes his pronouncements to people, either those who are poor and broken, or to people who are waiting. There were two people in Jerusalem who were waiting. Two people in Jerusalem who was waiting. It's interesting. Herod will hear about Jesus. All the Pharisees and the priests and the Levites and the scribes will know about Jesus only two years later. Before that, secretly, Jesus made a visit to Jerusalem and came back. You know how old he was? He was 40 days old. When he was 40 days old, he went to Jerusalem. Introduced himself to two people who were waiting for him and he went back. In Luke 2 and verse 25, And behold, again this behold comes up, right? 
God is telling us something. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for. Why was Christ introduced to him? Because he was waiting for. This is a season we wait for many, many gifts. Even different people sitting in the house of God today is waiting for, expecting different things. Simon was waiting for one thing. Look at verse 38, the other person. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spoke of him to all them that looked for. Anna was looking for. Simeon was waiting for. Both were waiting for a person. We are not waiting for a person. We are waiting for the things we can get out of that person. And we get it under the Christmas tree. Are you getting the picture? So suddenly we are taken into Jerusalem by the Holy Spirit in this narrative. He leaves all of Jerusalem aside. Why was he waiting? Why was Christ revealed to Simeon? Because he was waiting. I've told this before, but those who haven't been here before, please remember. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people gather in Jerusalem in the temple. Lions are there for sacrifices. Bulls are being offered. Rams are being offered. Lambs are being offered. Different lines. The Levites are busy. Priests are busy. Everybody is busy. But if you look in that line, there is one line for the poor. Or a few lines for the poor. For the poor, God had said, if you cannot afford a ram or a bull or a lamb, offer two pigeons, two turtle doves. For the poor, concession was always made in the law. In the law. Not that you cannot offer. You have to offer blood. But I will accept even the blood from a pigeon for you because you are poor. And if you notice carefully what everybody else missed, in that lion for the poor, in the arms of his mother, stood the king of Israel in his temple. In that line. He didn't stand in any of the other lines. He stood in that line. And his mother was holding him. The lion for the poor. Because she had only, not like the prosperity preachers preach that they had bars of gold and they lived like that. No, she didn't even have money to buy a ram. Forget everything else. His parents were poor. And he stood among the poor. And the gospel is preached to the poor. And they receive it. They receive it. Because they are looking for a redeemer. Simeon was waiting for something. What was he waiting for? Verse 25. Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Consolation means comfort. People also were looking for consolation. But their consolation was different. A king will come, overthrow the Romans, and he will establish his kingdom here and we will rule. But that was not what the consolation he was waiting for. If you read verse 26, it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he was not looking for consolation from Caesar. He was looking for consolation from sin. Because he is going to die anyway after he sees. If God were to tell you, as soon as you see my son, you will die, then your consolation is just to see his face and die. Not expecting for anything else in this world. You are actually waiting for the Messiah. So Simeon alone was waiting for a different consolation. And you know what happened? In verse 27, scripture says, And he came by the Spirit into the temple. He was somewhere else. He was somewhere else probably outside in Jerusalem. And the mother and the father had come in with the king. And the Spirit of God says, Run! Run! Your moment has come. The king has reached his temple. Probably would have been a strange sight to see this old man running. 
Reminds me of the prodigal son coming back home and the father running. Now it wasn't that. It was a different thing. The prodigal father running towards a son. I don't want to miss my appointment. For this day, for this moment, I waited. The king has come. The king has come. At that moment, he came by the spirit into the temple. And when the parents had brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the laws, what did he do? No questions asked. Nothing he asked. He went and he grabbed the child. He grabbed the child. What did he do? He cradled in his arms the consolation of Israel. And I believe God had said, when my son comes, one of his names will be what? Prince of Peace. And peace flowed into his heart. He was holding the consolation of Israel. He held close to his breast the very consolation of Israel. I don't know, church, what you and I are looking for. But God said He will meet us there. He will meet us there. The God who meets His people at their point of need. On the other hand, the other lady, another old lady, 84 years old. She's 84 years old. A widow. For years and years. And scripture says she had left, led a life of fasting and prayer. Not feasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer. If you are 80 years old, be found in the prayer closet and not in the kitchen. God needs you more there than there. When you reach heaven, let me tell you sisters, God will not smell the spice that is on your fingers. He will look at the calluses that was there on your knees. Anna was a woman who was given to fasting and prayer. What did she look forward to? Verse 38. She was looking forward for the redemption in Jerusalem. One was looking for consolation, the other was looking for redemption. They are not looking for the same thing. But God met them both. Looking at the same person, but different facets of the same person. Simeon was looking for comfort. Anna was looking for forgiveness. Redemption. Can you believe 84 years old Fasting and praying, not leaving even the temple courts and yet knows all that is worth nothing before God. I need a touch from Him to be redeemed. We look at our works and say, Lord, I am sure I am approved of God. God says, look at Anna. She knew she was not approved until she had met her Savior. What does scripture say? Coming in that instant, she too was brought in there by the Holy Spirit in that instant. And she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of Him to all, not everybody, all who looked for redemption. She also came. Two old people, I believe both of them are in 80s. Simeon may be even older. Think about it for a moment, okay? Think for a moment. An 84-year-old woman, maybe an 80, let's for, just for illustration purposes, an 88-year-old man. The 88-year-old man is holding the baby. The 84-year-old woman comes running before and they both are standing there looking at the baby and giving glory. Roll back time, another 1500 years earlier. An old man called Aaron and an old prophetess called Miriam was standing there and looking at the Redeemer of Israel, Moses, and saying, who do you think you are? 1500 years later, an old man and an old woman looks at a little baby and says, you are our Redeemer, we bow before you. That's the difference. Moses was Israel's savior in the Old Testament. 
and an old man and an old woman fought over the fact that he had married a Kushite woman. And here is a young one who is their elder brother who is going to take another Gentile bride and they are not fighting, they are bending their knee. That's how the spirit works, not the way flesh works. For one greater than Moses had come. God is asking us this morning, what are we looking for? Consolation? Redemption? He says, you will receive. The answer is my son. The answer is my son. Then almost two years later, the wise men from the east came. It took two years for the wise men to reach. And I always found it takes a long time for the wise to reach Christ. The foolish reach very fast. I'm not kidding. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. First Corinthians 1. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. So the names of the foolish things, Zechariah, Elizabeth, Joseph, Mary, a set of shepherds, Simeon, Anna, the wise men from the east, took two years. All they could see was a light. Poor fellows, by the time they reached Jerusalem, I can understand their neck. <laughs> Sitting before my computer, I know how my neck hurts. These guys are walking. That's the only thing given to them. Follow that light. I'm not giving you anything else. Just follow that light. It is a long, hard trip for them. It always is for the wise. You need to read C.S. Lewis' biography called Surprised by joy. He was a wise man. Very wise man. Professor, Cambridge, PhDs, all that. Struggled. Struggled for years and years and years with all his wisdom. Then one day he left home. And he reached college. And he says, when I left, I was an unbeliever. When I reached, I was a believer. It was so simple. It was so simple. All the wisdom of C.S. Lewis couldn't crack the mystery of God. He just believed and God said, No, you know, I am real. <laughs> These poor guys had to keep their eyes on the light. But they persisted. They watched. They followed. They persisted. But as soon as they resorted to their wisdom, the light disappeared. The problem is, no, we may look for Lord, show me, show me, Lord, show me how in my office, show me in my house, show me on the road. When you come into the church, we stop saying, Lord, show me, because we think we know. It is in the church more than everywhere else, you have to surrender and say, Lord, please show me here, let me not go without hearing you. But we say, I have come to the church, right? I know. That's the problem. As soon as they went into Israel, they walked straight to Jerusalem, the light disappeared. Because they thought, we know. And they ended up before the wrong king. They are looking for the king of the Jews and they ended up without a king appointed by the Romans who pretended, oh, I am very interested. Find that king for me. I also would like to worship him. But with the edge of the sword. Herod was troubled. Jerusalem was troubled. And if you know, I like that part of it. You see it in the book of Matthew. Herod called the scribes. He called them all. In verse 4 of chapter 2. Matthew 2, 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They took out their Torahs, 
their Talmuds, their uh, Bible dictionaries, the commentaries, everything, and said accurately, verse 5. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, so what are you doing in Jerusalem if your king is born in Bethlehem in Judea? And how come nobody moved even after that? Armchair professors of faith. They are all professors in the armchair. Professor, we know where Jesus is going to be born. We know exactly. I can tell you words. I can quote. What has he done to you? Has it made any? Has it moved your legs? Has it moved your heart? That's why the pronouncement was not given to anybody, but to the shepherds who made haste. Nobody moved from their seats. They all said, we know. When they left, the star appeared. If the light has gone out of your life, the Holy Spirit has spoke, it stopped speaking to you, please understand, you are in the wrong place, in the wrong company. When you leave that company, he will start speaking to you again. The light will come back. As soon as they stepped out, the light came. And they left. And they reached. Now these are wise men. With all the wisdom of the East. Maybe one sadhu from India. One sadhu from Persia. One sadhu from the Assyria. I don't know. All sadhus must be. All wisdom. And then they see this baby. When they see this little one and a half year old boy, not in diapers, poor Mary had no diapers, swaddling clothes it is called, okay, no huggies, running around, no angels, no proclamation, no lights, no glory. They're looking at this little boy. Now, is he the king of Jews? Verse 11, they had a choice to make. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. What did they do? They fell down and worshipped him. You know something? As soon as they fell down and worshipped, God started speaking to them through more than a star. Till then they were only given a star. Follow that star. The minute they bent their knee before the Savior of the world, God started speaking to them through a dream and said, Go this way. Don't go to Herod. You will not fear that king. Because once your knee is bent fearing God, you fear no man. Go back to your land. Don't even report what you have seen. Go. If you haven't heard from God, other than the Christmas light you put on, your Christmas tree every year, Probably your knee has not been bent. You haven't worshipped him yet. They chose to worship. And when they chose to worship, they saw more than a star. They heard, they were warned, and they obeyed. And they no longer feared the king in Jerusalem. For they had just bent their knee to the king of kings. Are we getting the narrative? Are you still hungry? Are you still hungry? For food? For the word? If you look at all the proclamations, one common thread in all the proclamations is that there was light. There was light in the holy place. And Gabriel arrived. There was light. When the angels appeared to the angels, there was light. For the Magi to follow, there was light. And when they saw the light, most of them were terrified. But verse 215 of Luke says, their response was different. Scripture says, they ran towards the light. What do we do when we see the light? Do we run for the light? Or do we run from the light? So when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, they said, let us now go to Bethlehem. That is how 
ultimately god will judge our hearts at the end of the service where are we going to run towards towards the light or run away from the light yet remember light will expose before the light will heal that's what scripture not scripture the man of god says the gospel first wounds before it will heal listen to zacharias pronouncement in luke 1 verses 78 and 79 luke 1 verse 78 through the tender mercy of our god with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace to give light who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death a lot of people don't even realize they may be sitting in churches for years but they're sitting in the shadow of death because they have never really bent their knees to Christ the real Christ who demands everything that's what scripture says in him was life and that life was the light of man the world likes the sights the lights and the sounds of christmas but when they hear the one who is born not to be born once they hear the one to be born is king they get afraid because a minute to hear a king you have to make up your mind savior is okay he saves deliverer is okay he delivers redeemer is okay he redeems consoler is okay he consoles but when you hear a king you have to make your choice are you going to bow or are you not going to that's why you see around the world christ is kept out of christmas because christ actually creates fear in the world but it is a fear of the light christ brings i see chapter 9 and verse 2 the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them a light has shined these are the actual lights of christmas you want to see the actual lights of christmas go through the bible not what is decorated in your homes the actual lights of christmas this light shines where people are sitting in the shadow of death john 15 and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it which is true i'm telling you it is true the king was there right in the temple in the arms of his mother all those who claimed to be the light in israel did not comprehend him from the high priest down nobody recognized him because you why darkness doesn't comprehend light it may have all the trappings and the dresses but they did not comprehend him john 3 and verse 19 on christmas day the first christmas day he came and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because the deeds were evil i want to put this picture across in the temple of jerusalem everything they were doing was according to the law but god was saying your deeds were evil therefore you did not comprehend light everything they did there he says your deeds are evil because you are doing with absolutely no repentance and there is no faith in your hearts you will not see the light has come into the temple you did not see are we seeing the picture on christmas day a light came in now it would never be put out for 2000 years man has been trying to put out that light and what will you and i do put out after today by the end of the month take down the lights i'll tell you you can take down the lights you can never take down jesus every christmas is a reminder of his coming back and the actual church is always waiting ready and prepared to welcome him back the 
That's why Jesus said when he comes back a second time, will there be faith on earth? Because when he came the first time, only a few set of people had faith and he revealed himself to them. God has to reveal. I cannot recognize. Please understand that you and I will never recognize God unless he reveals. And he will reveal himself to only those who are waiting for him. Even today, he is here. He will walk through and reveal himself to those who came for him. The most incredible person for me in this whole narrative is a man who is not mentioned. I call him the butcher of Bethlehem. Now if you have seen butchers, I hope you buy meat, you see butchers, you will see the chop, 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 all spattered with blood, they don't care anymore. Especially, you know, live chicken you buy, you'll say, no qualms. There was a butcher in Bethlehem. I believe he was a rabbi of the synagogue there. <laughs> in Hebrew Judaism, his term is called the mohel. The mohel is the person to whom you take the baby for circumcision. Thirty years later, when Jesus walks down Jordan, John the Baptist sees in Revelation, Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. A little later, Jesus is standing in the line, not jumping the queue like we do, standing in the line to be baptized. And John looks at him and says, You should be baptizing me, not the other way. And Jesus said, For the sake of righteousness, you baptize me. And as he is baptizing him, there is incredible revelation. He hears the voice of the Father. This is my Son, in whom I am well beloved, pleased. And he sees the Holy Spirit, the only man who ever saw the Holy Spirit descending. And he's touching the Son of God. He experiences the Trinity. The butcher in Bethlehem, on the eighth day, Jesus is taken to him. The very Son of God. He takes his knife and circumcises Jesus. The blood is all over his hands. He feels nothing. Though he's privileged, the first one to experience the blood of the Savior. He's not even mentioned. Can you actually physically experience the blood of the Redeemer and not be redeemed? Beware of church. You can be. You can be. He held the Son. He circumcised Him. He touched the blood. He knew nothing. Why? Because Christ refused to reveal Himself to Him. Because it was just a job. It was just a job. Let not your evangelism, let not your ministry, let not your life, let not your Christianity be another job. It is life. It is not job, it is life. That is what Gospel Lord John says. In Him was life. In Him was life. In Him was life. And the life was the light of man. Life was the light of man. That's what Christmas is all about. God reveals Himself to man. God reveals Himself to man. He reveals. He reveals. That's the name given to Him. The highest title given to Jesus in the Bible is Emmanuel. God with us. If God is with us, and God is with you, and God is with me, and I do not know this God. What am I doing? What am I serving? Have I become just another relic in the temple of God? The king has come and the king has gone. And I didn't know. Twelve years later, the king comes again. For two days he is there in the temple. They are all amazed, but they have no clue who he is. Another 18 years later, he comes back to the same temple and he throws them out and they ask him, in whose authority do you do this? Don't miss Christ during Christmas. 
Because Christmas is about Christ. It's not about anything else. It's not about Santa. It's not about reindeers. It's not about snow which wasn't there. It wasn't about any of those things. It was about Christ. And Christ still loves revealing himself. Still loves revealing himself. For that's the reason he came. So that he could dwell in us. So this morning, as we close... By faith, I want you to stand up. In a Christmas play, there was a boy called Harold. He was an MR child. Mentally retarded. MR child. So he was given the role of the innkeeper. And he was told, only say this, no room. No room. He has to be included. He is MR, so they gave him the simplest role. What is that? Say, no room. The play started. Joseph and Mary came. He pushed open the cardboard door. He looked at them. And he said, No room. Joseph and Mary turned and they walked away. Then he burst into tears and called them back and said, Take my room. (laughs) God's spirit can touch even an MR child in a Christmas play. What the innkeeper did not do 2,000 years ago, the boy said, I have room. Come in. That's what God is asking. When he came the first time, he had no room. Because he disturbed everybody. He says, even when I come today, either there is no room, or they tell me which room. But don't disturb my life. Stay in your room. Oh, we, we mock the Gentiles by saying, they put their God conveniently and pull a curtain. Oh, we do more than that. We try to pull the wool over the living God. He says, I'm looking for room. I came to live with man. I'm looking for hearts. That's why I said last Sunday, when Jesus finally begins his last message to the church in the book of Revelation, when he begins with the first church, he's in the middle of the candlesticks. Ephesus. He says, I know you. By the time the age ends and he comes to the last church in the book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea, he's outside and he says, I knock, will you let me in? And we have come to that age. We have come to that time where Christ is out and is knocking. Will you let me in? Christmas should be a time where you ask Jesus in. And if you let him out, ask him once again. Tell him, Lord, come in. Just between you and God. Just between you and God. You can just ask him, come in. I just want you to come into my heart. I receive you. I don't understand everything, but I just receive you. 30 years ago, when I asked him in, I didn't understand anything except the fact I told him, come in. And I didn't know what was coming in. And he disturbed. He created a lot of disturbance in my life. He still does. But I have experienced him as my redeemer, as my consolation, as my savior. And as my king. Father, this morning, we stand in awe of your son. Who'd stoop to that level. So that the poorest, the weakest, the meekest could identify with their savior. A little boy. 
a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes put in a manger oh anybody can identify the poor the broken the wretched oh they can identify with him i pray lord today at the end of this message many will hasten their spiritual steps towards the heavenly bethlehem the heavenly jerusalem haste and worship you it's okay if we have nothing to give like the shepherds we have nothing to give sheer excitement of meeting you but we will do one thing after we have met you we will go abroad and proclaim you and we will praise you and we will glorify your holy name but i pray for both the poor the foolish the rich and the wise or everyone needs you there's only one savior there's only one name there's only one god and i pray lord today everyone will ask jesus in like mary give each one the courage to say behold your servant let it be unto me according to thy will let christ be birthed in hearts today lord i pray and let christ be manifested through those hearts through those lives to the outside world we just thank you we just praise you as we go now for a time of fellowship and through into the week i pray father christ will walk with us and we will walk with him thank you father for in jesus precious name we pray amen amen by the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of the father and the fellowship of the holy spirit rest and abide with each one of us amen and amen